today, so you all got me. So forget, forget everything that guy just said. Uh, thank you all very much for having me down. Uh, oh, do I have to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I know um, attorneys don't like to be recorded. No, absolutely not. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you guys for having me down. I I pulled into the parking lot at the church and had a panic that there was nobody across the street. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm in the wrong spot. Getting my phone out to call Clint. And then I was like, oh, yeah, there, there it is, right across the street. So it's, so it's really good. Um, thank you guys ha for having me down today. Uh, like any attorney, I'm going to probably have you all flip in your book. So we're actually not going to use a PowerPoint on this. We're going to use the law itself, and I'll, I'll go over to the law, and then I'll tell you all the things that are not contained in the law. Uh, I was not uh, able to do this the other day, but I brought everything, uh, Chris. Um, I managed to uh, find this stuff. It was actually in my car, uh, which is this time of year, we're still planting things uh, where I farm, and uh, it was just bare, layered under... Uh, layers of clothes, tools, some GPS stuff that doesn't work. All right, so the what I have found to be the most effective visual, one of the two in, in agriculture law of any sort, or law for that matter, comes down to a, a game of Monopoly. Uh, how many people in here have not played this game ever? My child has now found the joy of this at nine years old and I've captured now on video, the first time playing, he was ecstatic, then cried and bawled his eyes out, and then he ended up winning the game. And that, isn't that just about how this works? So when you guys are playing, what goes in the middle? Does anybody know? What would you say, ma'am? Oh, you don't know? Anybody? Well, you all said you've played before. The what? Been too long? Well, my child would like to play you. He would play three consecutive games a day if he could. Usually what I'll have is people say that's where the money goes, right? When you're playing, if there's community chest or any of that stuff. The rules of this game say do not put money in the middle. And most people are shocked to know that, right? Now, as, a, as an attorney, I might point out that means that who taught you the rules? somebody that didn't read the rules, right? And there is nothing more effective than that that I have found for how we communicate uh, the, the parts and the statutes that we have uh, in Kentucky. In, in Scott County, where I farm, I, uh, most of the legal knowledge that I ever acquired in my life was done at the Cedar Post. It was a gas station primarily, but they sold sandwiches and things like that too. And at the Cedar Post in the back, if you were having heart trouble one day, this man would tell you what to do and that'd cure your heart trouble. You'd go in the next day and your transmission is slipping in your truck. That same guy <laughs> was an expert in that as well. So by the time we leave here today, at least you'll be able to tell your friends what the fence law is. So in your book, uh, we're going to start with uh, the definitions of a fence. So I, I want to point out what the law says, and sometimes what the law says and what the laws are are uh, two different things. We, what we have is statutory law, which is what we're going to read, and we have other things that are called uh, judge-made law or case law or common law. It's all three different ways of saying the same thing. And in that, uh, we can talk about what judges have found. So number one, in 256... 010, the definition of a legal fence, because that is what you are required to have. So when we go through the definitions, then I'm going to tell you the two prevailing thoughts for the law. But number one is a strong and sound fence, four feet tall. Number one, that should be sending some red flags. <laughs> Unless you're raising, I don't know, pot belly pigs, uh, your, your fence should probably be taller than that. Comma, so close that cattle cannot creep through. Number one, have any of you all seen cattle creep through a fence? Now, compare and contrast that with what you've witnessed on fence. I would not call that a creeping event. Usually it's very violent, or once the first one starts, 
Uh, it kind of gets amplified after that. Uh, judges in modern times do not get out there with a tape measure or a ruler. I'm going to steal one of these, by the way. Somebody didn't have it. I'm, I'm taking that with me. Uh, uh, they're not going to come with a stick out there and measure the fence. What they're going to say is the law says some things here, but the intent of the law and the effect of it is you've got to build a fence sufficient enough that the cattle can't get out. So usually I'll have a, a kid or somebody that has come with their parents, and I'll read that and say, well, what do you think a good fence is? And usually the adults are very silent, like you all are, and the kid will say, well, if it keeps the cows in. And he's right. If the, cattle, if the fence can keep the cattle in, generally speaking, the law doesn't care. If the fence does not keep your cattle in, you, as the owner of the property, and you as the owner of the cattle, start to have problems. When you all drove to fence school today, I've never been on this end of the county. I don't even know where I am, uh, Clint. I figured, but I have been very lost in uh, the, the greater area here uh, before trying to find people's places. The sending a point on a, a map would be highly efficient, uh, but I, uh, I listen to my podcast and I will miss exits and everything else. Uh, but uh, the, the law will say that, that you are required to keep your cattle inside of the fence. So that's kind of a Monday morning quarterback situation there, right? It's what you should have done. It's what you should have constructed. So everything that we have is going to flow from that standpoint. There are two things that you need to consider in the fence law and you need to keep in the back of your mind. Number one, you have an obligation to keep your animals on your piece of property or liability to you as the cattle owner and then to the cattle farm owner because that can be two different things if you're renting ground or running partnerships with somebody else. And then number two, you are required, if you're the property owner, to have a boundary line fence on the piece of property. What does that mean? Well, it means you need to know where the boundary line of your property is and then put a fence on there. So I haven't done this before with Chris, and now he's walked away, so he's not going to see. Uh, here's my second analogy in the law. Have I done this one for you, Chris? No. Now, it's, it's new, uh, a plunger, and this is, the, this is what I'd really like to drive home with the rest of the law. Number one, you might have been taught something incorrectly, but now you've got the statutes, right? But what is the, the thing about a plunger? It's that you need a plunger, you need to own a plunger before you need a plunger. Have any of you all ever found yourself in a situation where you really needed a plunger, but it was not in your immediate uh, uh, possession. <laughs> I, I don't know what you do. Maybe you're over at your friend's house. You, you start a fire as a diversion in the bathroom. You get out of there. You're just, I don't know why that, I'm sorry about your house. Uh, but a plunger and fence line boundaries are the same thing. You need to know all about them and be prepared for that before you start doing anything. Because I cannot tell you the number of fence line disputes that I've been involved with that end up in a property line dispute. So you're just looking to get fence built, but turns out your fence was not on the right property line to begin with. Or somebody wants to make a, what's called a counterclaim in the law back against you to, uh, to know where the, the, the line is. So I'm mixing this up a little bit from normal, but unless you all have one of these, do you know where your property line is? Meaning, when was the last time your farm was surveyed? You have a survey. Well, I've got a deed. The, the deed to my family's farm when we first came here from Virginia in the 1790s starts at the, where the Elkhorn Creek and the Kentucky River meet. Walk uphill to the large sycamore tree. Doesn't give a direction. The whole hillside is sycamore trees, but it's the large one. And it just says uphill. It's all a hill, so you, you could pick any, any degree of radiance you want, but some of these old deeds are absolutely terrible in terms of descriptions, unless those have been converted somehow to a modern uh, survey, you can and frequently will find yourself in a spirited discussion with your neighbor sometimes about where 
the property line is. As things have evolved and over time, usually those things uh, correct themselves through one function or another, including adverse possession if, if it's come to that. If somebody else has been maintaining that side of the fence for 15 years and there hadn't been a dispute, even before your lifetime, you know, that property might be theirs at that point. It's not uncommon in my profession to say, well, granddaddy told me it was 100 acres. And I can't tell you how many times that I've had that, but well, that's great. Uh, but uh, the surveyor and, and a GPS system says that you own 86. And people cannot believe that. And if you all uh, rent farm ground, or I'm sure Clint has seen a bunch where, well, I know that that farm's 100 acres. No, no, it's not. Uh, the, the, the field map says uh, something completely different. How many of your all's FSA maps are uh, an attempt at reality? Uh, but, but sometimes the croppable acreage on those uh, don't necessarily reflect. So in the fence law, we're talking about two concepts, although legally are very uh, distinct from one another. In practicality, it's the same thing. Number one, keep your cattle inside your fence. And then number two, fence on the boundary line, the perimeter of the property. The law absolutely does not care about your interior fence. That's what everything else is about. That's also why I'm never, the, the speaker before, Jeremy, on the electric fence is never going to come on my property because I don't want to get made fun of uh, like he's making fun of his neighbors. I have fixed a lot of things. Uh, if I had a piece of copper wire in the bucket and it was time, uh, I did not grow up with a four-wheeler. Uh, my dad was certain I would impale myself on something, so I wasn't going to walk all the way back, but I have this piece of wire, it'll make do. And then the make do's become make do's, and over time, the, the fence uh, ultimately fails. And that's what we're here to talk about uh, today, is some of the um, consequences that flow from not having that fence. Yes, sir? that a prescriptive easement, so the, the vehicle for the 15 year review is a, a concept called adverse possession and it's got some prongs uh, that go with that. A prescriptive easement is when you have adversely possessed that easement. So you've trespassed for 15 years using you, normally a, a right of way, an access point, something like that. You've driven, I'm guessing, through somebody's property and then you go, and then they deny you that access at some point in the future. You go to the judge, and you can have an easement created by prescription if it's been in use for 15 years or a couple other little factors. But you're not asking to own the ground. You just want to access another point. So it's not exactly adverse possession, but there are two P's right next to each other in the pod. It's statute. It's statute. Both. Yeah, it's 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 statutory that's laid out in the, the KRSs, but it's absolutely case law. Now that varies from place to place. We're so close to Indiana here, I can almost smell it. Um, I have a disdain for Indiana. Not, not that it, if any of you fine people are from there, uh, <laughs> it, it's mostly some chair throwing from a gentleman when I was a child uh, that, that most of that is, uh, that, that flows from. But uh, those are, those are two P's in the exact same pod. So an easement by prescription is that as well, but it's a case law situation. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, you can purchase an easement. You can create an easement, and that's one of the ways. You, yeah, you can probably get it through a fight if uh, if you wanted to otherwise. But another theme that I'm going to tell you is do not sue a neighbor. Just that is that is, don't sue a neighbor. That should be your your court of last resort is to actually take somebody uh, to the mat on that. But maybe talk to them. Uh, in your situation, are you landlocked from the front, or is it a matter of ease? Okay, and that, is, that, that also frequently happens, that you could technically access your ground through wholly owned property that connects, but 
in the reality or the practicality of it is to use a different route. Uh, sure. Uh, in that situation, I would talk to the neighbor. Uh, but if you've been doing it for so long, 15 years is kind of the magic bell that goes off. Now, that's different because the 15 years has to be done without permission. So you don't ever get, it's like setting the alarm on your clock. You just never get to set the alarm. If you do it without permission, once the 15 years is done, a magic bell dings. Still have to go to court to get an easement. No, it can be both. It's a concept called tacking where you, where you take that. But now that you have permission, your clock stopped running. We'll, we'll talk about more of that later. I'm, I'm always interested in adverse possession cases. Uh, they're, they, are, they are fun. Uh, so from this point forward, when I talk about the actual obligations under the law here, they're pretty easy to read and they're very uh, short. Uh, in O2O, now normally when I give uh, fence law talks, I will say, you can have an actual recorded agreement out there. You can look in your deeds or a Les Pettis book or whatever they have here in the county. You happen to know. Uh, it, you just have a deed book. Uh, I've had to look that up here once and now I've forgotten. Uh, you can have an agreement where two neighbors have gotten together and agreed to modify the default setting under the law. The default setting is each person is responsible for their half. Not 50% of the fence, their half. And it sets where your half and your neighbor's half is. In O2O on the next page, that says you can come up with whatever agreement you want with a neighbor, and you can record that thing in the Davies County uh, Records Office, or however the, the county clerk would want to accept that and file it. Normally when I talk about this, I will say, these things never happen, right? Um, and statistically, in my uh, tenure as a, as a law guy, very, very few of these things exist, but they do in this county. There was an attorney back in the 20s or 30s that recorded a few of these things, so I have seen them here. Um, and I don't remember that man's name. I mean, he's, I'm sure he's been dead for years and years, but just be aware that you could have an agreement that would supersede the law if it had been recorded uh, with your farm. From this point forward, there's really only two more uh, statutes that, that are super about the fence. And then you have another statute or two and then some case law and practicality about the liability that flows. In 030, 030 just says, this boundary line fence is an obligation of both of the owners of the two pieces of property. And then it says, look back into 042, which we're going to have here in a minute. Uh, if there is a, a breach that is your fault or the cattle owner's fault, it, it has a mechanism here for placing a lien on those cattle. Uh, it doesn't call it a priority lien but you can't have a lien created against your cattle uh, it, for failure to keep your cattle in and then them cause harm. Lien on the cattle is going to be the least of your worries uh, on that if, if your cattle get out and cause harm. In 042, this is the question that I get really, really frequently. If you'll look into sub 6, sub 6 is where the rubber meets the road in terms of the farm fence law in Kentucky. It says for all of you guys that are in the room, if you all are on your property, and Clint's on his side of the line, and we determine the 50% mark, let's say that we share a thousand foot common boundary line. Now that thousand feet is a thousand running feet. It doesn't matter if it's a straight line, it doesn't matter if there's a corner, it doesn't matter if the surveyors were chasing snakes when they built your all's lines. It's a thousand feet. Number one, if we ever determine where that thousand foot mark is, what should you do? Ever. 
You're going to mark it. You're going to mark it in a very permanent way because if you've ever had the occasion to go and step that off, there's a problem probably, right? And you just want to remember or have a nice visual so that everybody's on notice about where that mark is. So once we've established that mark, my fence, my obligation is the fence to my right. So again, for you guys, it's going to be your right, my left. For me, it's going to be my right, your left. That's how the, the division of this fence takes place. I am required to keep, or wait a minute, to establish and then keep and maintain the fence for that 50%. That's a very different concept than 50-50 on the 1,000 feet of fence, right? Because my side of the fence is going to have hills and rivers and creeks, and your side of the fence is always going to be what? Flat ground, four feet of topsoil, the posts just drive themselves. They come with a free DeWalt gun uh, uh, out there. Uh, I've tried to pick up a free DeWalt gun this week, but Mr. Jackson keeps a pretty tight eye on his. Uh, uh, hadn't happened yet. Um, but that, those are the, that's the obligation under the law. That really is the pinnacle of what Kentucky law is on the subject. Everything else talks about what if you don't. Right? So we've established what you should do. Everything else is what happens when you don't. So what happens when you don't? 042, other than sub 6 and then the part about the lien in 7, the rest of this is an instruction manual for you and the judge that will hear your case. If the other side fails to maintain or if there is no... Uh, boundary or division line fence, it tells the judge what to do. The judge has to make one of two determinations if you decide to sue somebody. Number one, they have to determine if no fence exists. That's a slam dunk. If there is no fence, then the judge, you just take a picture of no fence and go into the judge and say, judge, there's no fence. I've tried to get the other side to agree and they haven't then the judge shall order. There is no leniency. There's no gray area. If no fence, then you must build fence. And for some people, they think, well, how would that ever happen? But think about how many farm sales you go to where the whole thing is now offered in tracks. And so you've got two or 300 acres that are broken up into how that original owner, maybe the, the predecessors in title, they might have spent a lifetime or over a couple generations putting together small tracks into one contiguous one, or they could have just offered it for sale in multiple tracks, and you've gone and bought two or three. Uh, as cattle producers, maybe you go and buy two or three of the tracks that are more rolling and not suitable for row crop, and then the row crop guys are there just to buy the row crop and aren't interested in the, the hills uh, where they can't. Uh, put a planter in the ground. In either event there, you've got brand new neighbors where you didn't before, and at the date of the auction when you bought it, you didn't know, uh, number one, who that neighbor was or where any of those fence lines might be. So that's kind of how you can come to own property where absolutely no fence exists. These are just lines on paper. Uh, the second part of that is if you can prove that your neighbor's fence is inadequate, or i.e. bad fence, then you can force them to build fence. What does that mean? How do you prove that your neighbor has bad fence? Your cows got out at least once. And not only did they get out, but you've documented that they've gotten out on their side. So when I first started doing this, I talk about Polaroid pictures and stuff like that. So, you know, you kind of come to date yourself. Uh, but now everybody's got a I've got two. I've got a KDA phone that keeps calling and then probably my lovely bride. Uh, I suspect several. I ordered a pallet worth of parts from Shoop uh, Manufacturing and I suspect that I did not tell them my farm address and they're sitting at my house in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, so <laughs> I will not be taking the uh, Western Kentucky Parkway back. I will be <laughs> going back through 64 and uh, trying to put that stuff in my car. It'll just be simpler. Uh, like that. Uh, but you have to prove that those cattle have escaped. 
And so you can take pictures and do that, but in those catalysts scaping, and, and that's kind of where the rubber meets the road here. You, you go and prove that the catalyst scaped, and that's how you get your neighbor ultimately to build fence if you can't come to an agreement or an accord prior to that. The reality of some of this stuff then shifts into who's at fault or am I liable for the cattle escaping? And the answer is going to be always yes. Now to what degree you need to write a check can be anywhere from 100% of the damages, normally, down to zero, possibly, up to 200% of the damages if it's happened more than once. So think about that. First time they get out, they cause $10,000 worth of damage. You or your insurance company writes a check to cover that $10,000, especially if those cattle escape on your side. The second time they get out, if you damage your neighbor $200 or uh, $10,000 then, you're writing a check for $20,000. That's laid out. Uh, there in the statute after 042. So when you guys are running cattle, just, just realize whether you want to or not, you are engaging in an activity that the law treats essentially the same as blasting, mining, or anything else that's considered an ultra-hazardous activity. It's, it's something called a strict liability uh, under the law, and there's some different theories behind that, but they just deem it to be so dangerous that if you're at, it takes very little to find you at fault, and then you're, you're paying damages that can be the result of more than what you're doing. So a factor of two in this situation, you can pay double damages. So, and, the, and the way that the markets are going, you might be, uh, you, you might be buying me a ham at Christmas or something. Uh, I, th part of this is to, to make everybody aware of the fence law, but then number two, it's, it is to scare you a little bit. It's to scare you, number one, into buying insurance, making sure that you're, that you're running insurance, and, and that's a covered event under the policy that you have. And then number two, I just don't think a lot of people think about it. I don't think a lot of people recognize how relatively a low margin industry we are in, at least currently, uh, with cattle and the law that doesn't care what your margin is. The law doesn't, doesn't, doesn't care how much money you're making. It's if you ha cause the harm, you will compensate uh, the uh, plaintiff in that situation. And I say plaintiff because you're going to be the defendant. Somebody's going somebody's gonna to sue you. An observation that you might want to, that I might give you from a lawyer's pr perspective because uh, I've got to go spray and plant soybeans this afternoon. That is my one stop and get some parts <laughs> off my front porch. Uh, is If I took off my farmer lawyer hat and just put on a lawyer hat, I don't care whether you're making money at cattle. What I'm going to do is say, Farmer Bob has 150 of these things. And oh my God, they're worth $1.60 a pound. That's a lot of money, right? That's all they're going to see. They're just going to see the assets. They're not going to see the hard work or any of the rest of that stuff. They're just going to see you as a target-rich environment. And if they've got a plaintiff that, you, that they think that they can um, successfully sue you on, they're going to do it. Uh, so we're not going to do any of that, right? Because we're going to keep the cattle, uh, keep the cattle on the property. So the, the division line fence, when we create that thing, needs to be on the boundary. And let's just assume that that thing is, has been found and created and we've put there. The law, when I've actually seen fence ordered built, has been exclusively woven wire with a single strand uh, barbed wire on top or in areas where the terrain will not support woven wire, you can't stretch it up and down enough, uh, five strands of barbed wire. But that, is, that was in some pretty extreme country. It was up in Lewis County, uh, Kentucky. Also on the Kentucky River, but you get about, oh, 50 feet off the Kentucky River up there, and it's hills and valleys and dales and things like that. Uh, the fence law there 
stuff that's been ordered built is a passive system. It doesn't require active inputs like uh, your electric fence would, either through a, a solar panel on top of your charge box or an active um, supply from your uh, lo local electric provider. So the fence law is designed for a passive fence and that's what it describes in the law. Uh, if I stopped right now, you all are all scared and can walk away, right? And I've got a few more minutes, so what we're going to talk about now, what's, what's the question that always follows? Now that you know the fence law, you know your, your obligation, what's always the question? Oh, come on. Yeah, my neighbor doesn't think the same way. That is what the problem is, and that's always the problem, and I don't see that, that, will, that there will be a solution ever. Your neighbor may or may not be raising cattle. Your neighbor might be a row crop farmer, and that's probably your best case scenario. Uh, to be able to print this law off and educate your neighbor and say, hey, you know, you've got some obligations under the fence law. Uh, we need to build some fence. The stuff that's there has deteriorated to the point that it's, it's no longer uh, useful to uh, keep putting panels up and stringing wire and stuff like that. I'm out of old tires. Uh, to, to use as insulators, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and maybe you can come to some sort of accord where they actually pay their half or something towards their half. Even if they're paying some materials and things like that, you might be better off. What about your other scenarios? Now it's you had a great neighbor, but now you're dealing with the grandkids. And all the, any of those grandkids ever live in Owensboro? No, nah, they're all in Florida. It's, I don't know. I don't know where people go in Kentucky, uh, other than Florida. It's, I mean, it seems like there's one of two places we're assigned and allowed to go, and that's here at home or in Florida. Uh, so you're dealing with kids who see that farm or their side, if if it's a farm, is nothing but rental income, or an investment piece of property, or that was granddad's place, or something like that. Um, they love income. They do not like expenses. And so those people will fight you tooth and nail on building or maintaining their fence. Uh, the third category might be your rural neighbor. And I declare, unless I knew I was in Owensboro driving in just a few minutes ago, I would not have recognized coming around the, the bypass because I never take that. I, like, I just like going through downtown, which is totally different. But you all need a few more fast food restaurants. Really, I mean, that, that's, that's what I think you all need. Uh, but, but growth has come to this whole area in a big way, and partly because it's a great place to live, right? It's not Lexington, Louisville, Bowling Green, or God forbid, Northern Kentucky. You know, it's still a slower pace of life, good school systems, and people generally get along with one another. Except when these people buy a five acre lot out in the county and start building, right? Or start building next to you. Or how many people do you all have right now that your all's predecessor and title peeled off a couple lots? And it's always in the front, right? It's always in the front of the farm. The front means the road. Are those good neighbors? Well, I'm related to some of them, but I'm still going to say no. Uh, because do they own a recycle place or a compost area in their yard? What are they going to do with theirs? They're going to throw it. If there's a fence, are they maintaining it? <laughs> no. But the, so that makes it easier for them to throw their stuff over on your side. Or the sticks, nothing ever falls in their yard, right? It always ends up on your side. Y'all ever notice that? So the people that are building some of these places out in the county are going to give you single finger waves while you're moving equipment, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah and they're, they're very patient. Uh, uh, on that. But then number two, I've seen those folks that that do move to the county primarily for the view that you are providing being the ones that are the, the most adamant about not uh, participating in their legal obligation. Once you do point some of that stuff out, I've actually had pretty good success rates with just showing them, hey, you know, you live out here I'm not sure if you were aware of that. And sometimes how you approach the subject with somebody and the tone you set to begin with 
somebody might mirror that on the other sides. Human nature and interactions fascinating as an attorney just to see how people do it. You tell somebody they're wrong, they're going to fight you right back. You just say, hey, are you aware? Sometimes that sets a better tone. Well, sir, I'm completely aware now, but I'm still not doing it. That, that's your second uh, group of people. Uh, and that second group of people can be uh, maybe split into curmudgeons that just aren't going to spend anything. And then maybe the reality of the second part is they, they can't afford it. You've got a, a, a widow or a pensioner or something like that on the other side of the fence. When you all build fence, you can put it on your Schedule F, right, and depreciate it out. They can't do that. So there is no tax advantage, no savings. That is just real money that they'll never get back on that side. So that is something that you might want to consider in when you do more than just your initial education efforts, that you're not going to have the court system additionally uh, educate them, is you might want to consider if they can pay anything and maintaining that relationship that you have with that neighbor, that might be worth more than a few thousand dollars. I, I am not a fan of suing neighbors. That is the absolute last thing that I would ever do. Because I have been involved in some just colossal lawsuits over fence laws and then boundary laws. And I tell this every single class. But I have two brothers that have spent millions of dollars, plural, a piece, millions, a piece, fighting each other on fence laws and boundary laws. And it was in an inheritance situation because both of these fellas asked the same girl to prom in the 50s. And then it wasn't until I was very deeply involved and after I started doing fence schools uh, that I found out that the, the, the lady in, in question didn't go to prom with either one of them. So I don't, like, I want to know so much more. And I need to ask one of these two guys before they die, like, you know, why? why? Like, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're mad, you're mad. Uh, but uh, uh, people will fight and, and kind of dig in in some of these positions. What you have ultimately, though, is an obligation to keep your fence up, right? And then number two, you have an obligation to not let your cattle get out. And so that hits me in terms of the absolute practicality of the situation. So what's more important to you, losing that relationship up there and building a little bit of fence, or keeping that person as a good neighbor. When your cattle inevitably get out one day, they'll probably call you, right? Not unless you, if you've sued them, you ain't never getting a call. You're never getting another Christmas card. Nobody's giving you a ham at Christmas. They're not doing any of that stuff. So if you can sometimes maintain that relationship, I'm gonna say that that might be a, a colossal win. The, the amount that they have kept up their fence though, improving, if the fence was bad, those cattle have gotten out some. Are you, how much of the dice are you willing to roll to create that body of evidence that a judge will then order them to build the fence? You've got two options on that. You can roll the bill, roll the dice and hope that the bill doesn't come up to everything that you've worked for. Or number two, you cannot run cattle in that paddock. Just exclude that area from from production. My parents have a, a, a farm that they've bought where my dad has excluded that area for production forever. And that's simply because it's a road and the T that comes into it's on a little bit of an incline. And if it rains, if they're even calling for snow, whether or not it snows, people will slide down that hill and through the fence and into the alf what is now an alfalfa field. So it is easier now. We don't even put the fence back up. <laughs> Across from that intersection, the plank ends, and then it resumes about 100 feet later. So you've got a pretty wide vector uh, there. Uh, one time, I don't think I've ever told this story. One time, our neighbor, uh, who's, a, who's a character, had a drunk man working for him that was feeding cattle in the winter, uh, slid through this when it hit the little uh, curb, well, a ditch. He fell off of the eight or 3,000 Ford, 
and the 3000 Ford was not recovered for about two hours, and that's how, about how long it takes the 3000 Ford to make circles in the field before it runs out of diesel fuel. It was absolutely amazing. Uh, I did not own a cell phone at that time, but my parents have you know, an old video camera where they, they watch that thing, and that's high entertainment. Uh, on that. But the, the, the point being, if you've got an area like that where it's foreseeable that the fence is either bad, meaning that you guys knowingly put your cattle in an area uh, pre-lawsuit with a neighbor, right? You put it in there knowing that fence was bad, I'm going to hammer you if we get in front of a jury. Number two, what about the escapes at the front? Anybody in here ever forgotten to shut a gate? Does anybody in here have a flawless, clean record? If we were pulling up your farmer stats online, would we see your 100% gate closing record? Now, sometimes I close the gate, I forget to latch it, or I get distracted, or there's a cow wanting to beat me to that gate, and for some reason I get a little distracted on that. Uh, how many people have fully functional cattle guards? They're cleaned out. It's two, two different things. You have a cattle guard. Uh, as I said the other day, is your cattle guard still making noises when you go over it? If it's not making any noise, that's probably not a good cattle guard anymore. It means it's solid. You've got a piece of concrete out there. You don't have a, a front fence. But if you have points that you know are bad or will be bad with weather conditions that are coming, I'm going to tell you as an attorney, you probably need to exclude your cattle from that area. It's not just bad fence. What else am I talking about? Even what, if it's in that perimeter with your neighbors, even if it is your, your side of the fence. What else could I be talking about where, depending on the, the weather, you might want to exclude the cattle from that paddock? Y'all don't have, Owensboro, let me tell you something about Owensboro. Y'all have got great barbecue, number one. It's all y'all talk about ever It's your barbecue. And then number two, the rest of the state doesn't knowingly put ditches in our fields. That's amazing to me, driving down here, and some farmer's like, you know what that field needs right there? Big old ditch. Let's, let's put one right through it. Uh, it'll be amazing. The, rest of the, the, the whole rest of the planet is like, oh, we don't want ditches, but y'all put them in on purpose. So I know y'all spend a lot of money. Just, just don't. I mean, it, hell, it'll be a ditch eventually. Uh, just save your money. It'll, be, it'll, it'll revert to a swamp. But water gaps, how many guys have uh, water gaps that are a function of your fence line with the neighbor. Almost inevitably, you're going to have a creek crossing at some point on your property, right? If that's fenced in and you know you have a big rain coming, you got to pull the cattle out of that. Good fence or bad fence, are your water gaps always there when you go back? Well, yeah, they are. You should just drive to the neighbors. If it's not there, go the next one down the creek. You'll, you'll find the thing eventually. Put buoys on it. It'll stay up. Uh, it might be in a tree, but you can go find the thing. But what I'm, what I'm saying is the law, when it's looking at that, is not only whether or not it kept the cattle in, the, a bit of a second prong if we're going to talk about case law is foreseeability on something like that. If it's foreseeable that you can put the cattle in a situation where you think they might get out, and they do, you're going to be at fault. So if you've got a situation where you have bad fence against that neighbor, don't put the cattle in. Now you weigh that economic consequence of trying it, and then look at, well, if the neighbor can pay anything towards their fence, I generally like that. That way they've got a little bit of skin in the game, they're aware of the law, you're not waiving any of that, and you can kind of go from that point forward. If you get them to pay anything, as counsel, as legal counsel, I'm telling you, you're probably better off. As the attorney, if you want to pay me to sue them, we can go do that too. But I'm going to tell you, your, your outcome will be much better if you've reached some sort of a court or agreement short of that lawsuit. Does anybody have any questions on the fence law? Uh, yes, sir. The, the fence law, when, you're, when it looks here in the, in the statute, uh, 
is 042 in your book. Sub 2, the owner of a parcel of real estate used for ag purposes can file one of these things. So really what that's saying is only one of the two of you have to be involved in agriculture. What your dad was doing was being very honorable in keeping up, you know, he was saying, uh, I'm engaged in economic activity. I don't want to have my neighbors pay half of my bill. Yeah, absolutely legally, but I bet that's a pretty good neighbor, too. Well, and the and I've sh sure. I got married and moved to Louisville in 2005, and that was the last year I had cattle. Number one, because I got a really good deal on a group of canina steers, and so you were talking about giraffes earlier. I, I don't; these were bred with some sort of mountain goat or jumping uh, kangaroo or something. Uh, but since then, I've never gotten a call as a row crop farmer that my cat, my corn was out in the road at two in the morning. So some of that stuff. Uh, Canon does change. One of the farms that I ran cattle on, even when I was in high school, I sprayed Tuesday after our, our other fence law uh, topic. And that farm, I have 360 new neighbors. And that's because somebody's put in a subdivision, and each one of their 150 foot wide lots, I'm responsible for 75% of that fence, or they are. And I have just elected a long time ago quit running cattle in a situation like that because I'm pretty sure they'd kill them. Every single year after Christmas, there's trees and potted plants and tinsel and everything that's thrown over the line. And now I'm getting to the point where I tuck back about 20 feet on the farming, but they somehow still go dump stuff in my field. I... I might have uh, I might have legally taught somebody a lesson on Tuesday that had done the same thing, and their garden was out in where my beans were last year. Oh, they haven't found out yet, I suspect, because I haven't gotten a phone call. Uh, but they're going to be real mad when my my soybeans are in there. Uh, there, I that's kind of why I keep checking the phone too, because I've got one of my guys is uh, planting and. Uh, I, I'm sure we're going to have a discussion uh, about that uh, when we get up there. Uh, they they wouldn't, I guarantee none of my neighbors would either know because I never tell anybody that. Or number two, anytime I'm there, I look homeless or approaching that in my, when, when, you, when you weld like I do, uh, most of your clothes will end up with holes in them uh, anyhow, uh, given, a, given a little bit of time. I'm going to probably stick around for a few minutes. Any time that Chris stands up, is uh, I've gone over uh, already there. Uh, but thank you all very much. Is, were there any other uh, big questions that anybody had? I'll stick around for a few minutes. Just, just realize as being a, a resident and, uh, and a, a member of the uh, Davis County community, if your all's cattle do get out and you all have any kind of escapes or need help fencing, particularly after hours on the weekend, everybody's got Clint Hardy's phone number here, right? Uh, he loves it. You just just call him, call him after dark or, or whatever. Uh, uh, Clint and Chris and I, uh, to tell you all a little bit of a background story, we met each other several years as uh, male dancers. Uh, we um, And then... I mean, we, we had to disband. Chris can't, uh, he, he lost his rhythm. Uh, uh, but but uh, Clint and I still do on the side. If y'all have a, a, yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, but, but seriously, you all have got, you all have got uh, um, Clint fields these phone calls all the time. Um, and, and I can kind of help or get involved sometimes. And uh, a lot of what I've done over the years is even, the neighbor doesn't believe it or something, and they'll call in and you just kind of explain it to them. And then it's not you telling them, it's somebody else, and some, sometimes that helps. And to and, the, and I'm saying this is a vast second, 
sometimes Clint could possibly make that phone call, but I, he's not going to want to because he has to live here. You know, I, I don't. Uh, anybody else have any questions? I'll stick around for a few minutes. Otherwise, I'm going to go uh, plant soybeans in a or somebody's tomatoes. Well. Okay, I'll try to real quick. All right, thank you all very much. Appreciate it.